Hi, everybody. This is Dave Vellante. Welcome to this CUBE conversation where we're going to go back in time a little bit and explore the early days of Kubernetes, talk about how it formed, the improbable events perhaps that led to it, and maybe how customers are taking advantage of containers and container orchestration today, and maybe where the industry is going. Matt Provo is here. He's the founder and CEO of Stormforge and Chandler Hoisington. Hoys is the general manager of EKS Edge and Hybrid at AWS. Guys, thanks for coming on, good to see you. Thanks for yeah. having me. Thanks. So Chenya, you were the, what, the vice president of engineering at Mesosphere, is that is that correct? Yeah, well, uh, vice president of engineering at Mesosphere and then uh, I ran product and engineering for D2IQ and Mesosphere. Yeah, yeah okay, yeah. okay. So you were there in the early days of, of container orchestration and Matt, you, you were working at a, a, a Docker Swarm shop, yep. right? Yep. Okay, so, I mean, a, a lot of people were, you know, using your platform. It was pretty novel at the time. Yeah. Uh, it was it was more sophisticated than what was happening with with Kubernetes. Take us back. What, what was it like then? Did you guys? I mean, everybody was coming out. I remember there was, I think there was one DockerCon, and everybody was coming. I think Kubernetes was announced, and then yeah. you guys were there. Doc, Docker Swarm was was announced, yeah. and there were probably three or four other startups doing kind of container orchestration. What, what were those days like? Yeah, I wasn't actually at Mesosphere for those days, but I know them well. I know the yeah, stories yeah, well. Okay. Um, uh, I came right as we started to pivot towards Kubernetes there. But um, it's a really interesting story. I mean, obviously they did a documentary on it, and. Uh, you know, people can watch that, it's pretty good. But um, I think, the, from my perspective, it was, it was really interesting how this happened. You had basically, uh, con you had this advent of containers coming out, right? So, so this new novel technology and Solomon and these folks started saying, hey, you know, wait a second, what if I put a UX around these couple of Linux features that got launched a couple of years ago? What does that look like? Oh, this is pretty cool. Um, so you have containers starting to, to crop up. And, and at the same time, you had folks like ThoughtWorks and other kind of thought leaders in the space uh, starting to talk about microservices and saying, hey, monoliths are bad and you should break up these monoliths into smaller pieces and any greenfield application should be broken up into individual scalable units that you, a team can, can own by themselves and they can scale independent of each other and you can write tests against them independently of other components and you should break up these big, big monoliths. And, now we're, we're, we're kind of going back to monoliths, but that's for another day. Um, so, so you had microservices coming out, and then you also had containers coming out at the same time. So they was like, oh, we need to put these microservices in something perfect. We'll put them in containers. And so at that point, you don't really, you, before that moment, you didn't really need container orchestration. You could just run a workload in a container and be done with it, right? You, didn't need, you don't need Kubernetes to run Docker. Um, but all of a sudden you had tons and tons of containers and you had to manage these in some way. And so that's where container orchestration came, came from. And, and Ben Heinemann, the founder of Mesos, was actually helping schedule Spark at the time at Berkeley. Um, and that was one of the first workloads was Spark for Mesos. And then his friends at Twitter said, hey, come over, can you help us do this with containers at Twitter? He said, okay. So he went and helped them do it with containers at Twitter. And that's kind of how that branch of the container wars was started. <laughs> And um, you know, it was really, really great technology. And it actually is still in production in a lot of shops today. Um, and more and more people are moving towards Kubernetes and Mesosphere saw that trend. And at the end of the day, Mesosphere was less concerned about, even though they named the company Mesosphere, they were less concerned about helping customers with Meso specifically. They really wanted to help customers with these distributed problems. And so it didn't make sense to, to just do Meso, so they took on Kubernetes as well, and I helped them do that. I remember uh, my, my uh, co-founder, John Furrier, introduced me to Jerry Chen way back when. Uh, Jerry, his, his first uh, in, uh, VC investment with Greylock was Docker. Mm -hmm. And we were talking and he's you know, very obviously very excited about it. And, and as Chandler was just saying, it, uh, Solomon and the team simplified you know, containers, yeah. you know, simple and brilliant. Right? And so you guys saw the opportunity where you were a Docker swarm shop. Why? Because you needed you know, more sophisticated you know, capabilities, yeah. but then you, you switched. Why the switch? <laughs> what was happening? What was the mindset back then? We ran into some scale challenges in kind of operationalizing or, or, or productizing our kind of our core machine learning. And, you know, we, we, we saw kind of the, the challenges, luckily, a, a bit ahead of uh, our, our time. And um, we happened to have someone on the team that was also kind of moonlighting uh, as one of the, the original core contributors to Kubernetes. And so as this sh sort of shift was taking place, um, we, we, we saw the flexibility uh, of what was becoming Kubernetes. Um, and 
uh, I'll never forget, I left on a Friday and came back on a Monday and we had lifted and shifted uh, two Kubernetes. The, the challenge was, um, you know, you, uh, at that time, you, you, you didn't have what you have today through EKS and uh, those kinds of services where um, just getting that first cluster up and running was, was super, super difficult, even in a small environment. And so I remember we, you know, we, we finally got it up and running and, and, and it was like, nobody touch it. Don't do anything. Uh, but obviously that doesn't, all, that doesn't scale either. And so that's really, you know, being kind of a, a data science focused shop at Stormforge from the very beginning. That's where our core IP is. Uh, our, our team looked at that problem and then we looked at, okay, all, there are a bunch of parameters and, and ways that I can tune this application and uh, why are the configurations set the way that they are and you know, uh, is there room to explore? And that's really where Stormforge so it's interesting came in. Because Mesos had much greater enterprise capabilities, as did Docker Swarm, at least they were heading in that direction. Yeah. But you still saw that Kubernetes w w was, was attractive because even though it didn't have all the security features and the enterprise features, because it was just so simple. I remember Chen Goldberg, who was at Google at the time, saying, no, we were focused on you know, keeping it simple yeah. and we're going for mass adoption, but is that kind of what you saw? Is yeah, and we made a bet, honestly. Uh -huh. uh, we saw that the, uh, you know, the growing community was really starting to, you know, we had a little bit of an inside view because we had, we had someone that was very much in the, in, in the original part, but you also saw the, the tool chain itself start to, uh, start to come into place, right, a little bit. And it's still hardening now, but um, yeah, we, as any uh, as any startup does, we we made a pivot and we made a bet, and uh, this this one paid off. Well, it's interesting because you know we said at the time. I mean, you had obviously Amazon invented the modern cloud. You know, Microsoft has the advantage of it's got this huge software stage. Hey, just now run it into the cloud. Okay, great. So they had their entry point. Google didn't have an entry point. Yeah. This was kind of a hail mary against Amazon, and it, and I, I wrote a piece. You know, the improbable rise of Kubernetes to become the OS you know, the cloud, but but I asked, did it make sense for Google to do that? They've never made any money off of it, but I had, would argue they, they were kind of, they'd be irrelevant if they didn't, if they hadn't done that. Yeah. But it didn't really hurt, certainly didn't hurt Amazon. You get EKS and you do containers and your customers, you embraced it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't know how, what it was like, you know, early days. I mean, I've, I've talked to Amazon people about this. It's like, okay, we saw it, but then, Talk to customers. What are they doing? That's right. That's kind of what the mindset is, right? Yeah, that's. I, I you know, I've I've been at Amazon a couple of years now, and you hear the stories. Oh, we're customer obsessed. We listen to our customers. Like, okay, okay, we have our company values too. You get told them, and when you're uh, when you get first hired on your first day, you never really think about them again. But at Amazon, that really is preached every day. It really is, um, uh, and. They, we really do listen to our customers. So when customers started asking for Kubernetes, we said, okay, and we built it for them. So I mean, it's, it's yeah. really that simple. Um, and and we also. It's not as simple as just building them a Kubernetes service. Amazon has, has a big commitment now to start, you know, getting involved more in the community and working with for, folks like Stormforge and 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 really listening to customers on what they want. And they want us working with folks like Stormforge and and, that, and that's why we're doing things like this. So, well, it, it's interesting because of course everybody looks at the ecosystem and says, oh, Amazon's going to you know kill the ecosystem. And then we saw an article the other day in um, I think it was CRN did an article. It's a great job by Amazon PR. They're talking about Snowflake and Amazon's relationship. And mm -hmm. I have said many times, Snowflake probably drives more EC2 than any other ISV out there. And so, yeah, may, the Redshift guys might not love Snowflake, but Amazon in general, you know, they're doing great, great things. And, and I remember Andy Jassy said to me one time, look, it, we love the ecosystem. We need the ecosystem. They have to innovate too. Mm -hmm. If they don't, you know, keep pace, you know, they're going to be in trouble. So that's actually a healthy, kind of a, a, a dynamic. I mean, yeah. as an ecosystem partner, how do you feel about well, that? Well, I'll go back to one thing. Without the work that Google did to open source Kubernetes, uh, Stormforge wouldn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> but without the effort that uh, AWS and, and EKS in particular um, provides and opens up for, for developers to, to innovate and to continue, continue kind of operationalizing the shift to, to Kubernetes, um, you know, we wouldn't have nearly the opportunity that we do to actually listen to them as well. Listen to the users and be able to say, well, what do you want, right? Our, our entire uh, reason for existence comes from asking users like, how painful is this process? 
uh, like how much confidence do you have in the you know out of the box defaults that ship with your you know with your database or whatever it is and uh, and and how much do you love uh, manually tuning your application and and uh, obviously nobody said I love that and so I think as that ecosystem comes together and continues expanding um, it's just it, it opens up an, a, a huge opportunity uh, not only for existing you know, EKS and uh, AWS users to continue innovating, but for companies like Stormforge to be able to provide that opportunity for them as well. And, and, and that's pretty powerful. So I think without a lot of the moves they've made, um, you know, th the door wouldn't be nearly as open for companies like Stormforge who are, you know, growing quickly, but are, are smaller to be able to, you know, to right. exist. Well, and, and I was saying earlier that, that you've, you're, and I wrote about this, you're going to get better capabilities. You're clearly seeing that cluster management. Yep. We've talked about better, better automation, security, the yep. whole shift left movement. Um, so obviously there's a lot of momentum right now for, for Kubernetes. I mean, you think about bare metal, you had you know, servers and storage, and yep. then you had VM yep. virtualization, VMware really, and then containers, and then Kubernetes in, as another abstraction. Yeah. I would expect we're not at the end of the road here. Yeah. Uh, what's next? Is there another abstraction layer yeah. that you would think is, is coming? Yeah, I mean, for a while it looked like, and I remember even with our uh, like board members and s some of our investors said, well, you know, well, what about serverless? And, yeah. you know, what's the next Kubernetes? And nothing we, as much as I love Kubernetes, um, which I do and we do, um, nothing about what we particularly do. Uh, we are b purpose built for Kubernetes, but from a core kind of machine learning and problem solving standpoint, um, we could apply this elsewhere uh, if we went that direction. And so uh, time will tell what will be next and there will be something, uh, you know, that will end up, you know, expanding beyond Kubernetes at some point. Um, but, y you know, I think, um, Without knowing what that is, you know, our job is to 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 serve our, you know, to serve our customers and serve our users in the way that they are asking uh, for that to take place. Well, serverless obviously is exploding. When you look again, we talked the ETR survey data. When you look at at the services within Amazon and other cloud providers, you know, the the, the functions off the, off the charts. Uh, so that's kind of an, an interesting and notable. Now, of course, you've got. Chandler, you got edge in your title, mm -hmm. you got hybrid in, in your title. So, you know, this notion of the cloud expanding, it's not just a set of remote services just only in the public cloud right. now, it's its coming to, uh, on premises. You actually, got a, Andy Jassy in my headspace, he, he said one time, we just look at, at data centers as another edge location. Right. Okay, that's a way to look at it. And then you've got edge. Um, so that cloud is expanding, isn't it? The definition of cloud is, is, is evolving. Yeah, that's right. I mean, customers want to run workloads in lots of places. Um, and that's why we have things like, you know, local zones and wavelengths and outposts and EKS Anywhere, mm -hmm. um, EKS Distro, and obviously probably lots more things to come. And there's, I, I always think of like Amazon's Kubernetes strategy on a manageability scale, where on one far end of the spectrum, you have EKS Distro, which is just the, a collection of the core Kubernetes packages. And you could, you could take those and stand them up yourself in a, a broom closet in a, in a retail shop. And then on the other far end of the spectrum, you have EKS Fargate, where you can just yeah. give us your container and we'll handle everything for you. Um, and then you, we kind of tried to solve everything in between for your data center and for the cloud. And so you can, you can really ask Amazon, I want you to manage my control plane. I want you to manage this much of my worker nodes, et cetera. And, oh, I actually want help on-prem. And so we're just trying to listen to customers and solve their problems where they're asking us to solve them. Cut. Go ahead. No, yeah. I would just add that in a more vertically focused uh, kind of orientation for us, like we, we believe that, op, you know, optimization capabilities should transcend the location mm -hmm. itself. And, and, and so whether that's part public, part private cloud, what, you know, that's what I love, part of what I love about EKS Anywhere, uh, it, you know, you should, you should still be able to achieve optimal results that connect to your business objectives uh, wherever those workloads uh, are, are living. Well, don't wince. So John and I coined this term called super cloud and uh, people laugh about it, but it's different. It's, it's, you know, people talk about multi-cloud, but that was just really kind of vendor diversity, right? I got yeah. a, I'm running here, I'm running there, I'm running anywhere. 
uh, but, but individually. And, and so super cloud is this concept of this abstraction layer that floats yep. wherever you are, whether it's on-prem, across clouds, and you're taking advantage of those native primitives um, and, and hiding that underlying complexity. And that's what, when we, at reInvent, the ecosystem was so excited, and they didn't call it super cloud, we, we, we called it that, but they're clearly thinking differently yep. you know, about the value that they can add on top of Goldman Sachs. Right, that to me is an example of a super cloud. They're taking their on-prem data and their, their, their software tooling, they're connecting it to AWS, they're running it on AWS, but they're, they're abstracting that complexity. And I think you're going to see a lot, a lot more of that. Kubernetes itself, in many cases, is being yeah. abstracted away. Yes, so, right. you know, there's a, dis a bit of a disappearing act <laughs> for Kubernetes, and I don't mean that in a, a you know, in an, uh, from an adoption standpoint, but, you know, Kubernetes itself is increasingly being abstracted away, which I think is, is actually super interesting. Yeah. Kubernetes doesn't really do anything for a company. Like we run Kubernetes, yeah. like how does that help your bottom line? That, at the end of the day, like companies don't care that they're running Kubernetes. They're trying to solve a problem, yeah. which is the, I need to be able to deploy my applications, I need to be able to scale them easily, I need to be able to update them easily. And those are the things they're trying to solve. So if you can give them some other way to do that, I'm sure you know, that's, that's what they want. It's not like a, you know, a, a big bank is making more money because they're running Kubernetes. That's not, yeah. that's not the, Goal. And it gets subsumed. It's just going right. to, you know, in, become invisible. Right. Exactly. You guys back to the office yet? What's uh, what's the situation <laughs> oh, with, I, with work and I, hybrid work? You know, I, I I work from my house, and I you know we go into the office uh, a couple times a week. So it's it's uh, yeah, it's 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 a crazy time. It's a crazy time to be managing and hiring, and um, you know, it's 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 definitely a challenge. But there's a lot of benefits for working at home. I got two young kids, so I get to see them. Uh, grow up a little bit more working working out of my yeah. house, so it's nice. Awesome. You back in the office yet? Or? So we're in even as a smaller you know uh, startup, we're in 26, 27 states: uh, <laughs> Canada, Germany. We got a little bit of presence in in Japan, so we're very much distributed. Um, we uh, have not gone back, and I'm not sure we will. Okay, uh, so you you think it permanently remote potentially? Yeah, I mean we, we made a a pretty like for us, the timing of our Series B funding, which was w where we started hiring a lot, uh, was just before COVID started really picking up. So we, you know, thankfully made a, a pretty good strategic decision to, to say, we're going to go where the talent is. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was harder to find, for sure, especially, and we're, we're compete, it's incredibly competitive. Uh, but yeah, we've it. It was a good decision for us. Um, we are very intentional about you know getting the teams together in person, you know, as often as possible and in in, in as safe as way possible, obviously. Um, but you know, it's been a it's been a pretty interesting uh, journey for us, and and something that I'm I'm not sure I would I would change to yeah. be honest with you. Yeah. Well, Frank Slootman moved Snowflake's HQ to Montana. Yeah. Let that tell you. <laughs> and and can folks like Michael Dell saying, hey, same thing as you, wherever they want to work, yeah, you know, bring yeah. yourself and wherever you are is cool. And and Chandler, do you think that the hybrid mode for your team is kind of the the, the operating mode for the for the foreseeable future? A you know, days I think in, I think there's out. a lot of benefits in both working from the office. I, I don't think you can deny like the face to face interactions. It feels good just doing this interview face to face, <laughs> right? And I can see your mouth move. So it's like there's a lot of benefits to that um, over a chime call or a Zoom call or whatever, you know, that, that also has advantages, right? I mean, you can be more focused at home. And I think some version of hybrid is probably in the industry's future. I don't know what Amazon's exact plans are. That's above my, yeah, yeah, my sure, pay grade. But, but um, <laughs> I know that like in general, the, the industry is definitely moving to some kind of hybrid model. And, no question. and like Matt said, getting people, I, I'm a big fan. At Mesosphere, we ran a very diverse, like remote workforce. We had a big office in Germany, but we'd get everybody together a couple times a year for engineering week or, yeah. or something like this. And you get a hundred people, you know, just dedicated to spending time together at a hotel and, you know, Vegas or Hamburg or wherever. And it's a really good time. And I think that's a good model. I like that model. Yeah, and I think just more ETR data, the current thinking now is that uh, the, the uh, hybrid is the number one sort of model. Yeah. 36%, uh, the CIOs believe 36% of the workforce are going to be hybrid mm -hmm. permanently is mm -hmm. kind of their, their call. A couple days in, a couple days out. Yep. Um, and the the percentage that is remote is significantly higher, probably you know high twenties, whereas historically it's probably fifteen yeah. percent. So permanent changes, and that that changes the infrastructure you need to support it, the yeah. security models, and everything. Yep. You know how yep. you communicate. So, yeah, I remember when COVID 
you know, really started hitting in, in 2020, um, the, the big banks, for example, had to, I mean, you want to talk about innovation and ability to, to shift quickly. Two of the, the, the bigger banks that have, in, uh, in fact, adopted Kubernetes uh, were able to shift pretty quickly. You know, systems and things that were, mm -hmm. you know, historically, you know, it was in the office all yeah. the time. And some of that's obviously shifted back to a certain degree, but that ability, it was pretty remarkable actually to see that uh, take place for some of the, the larger banks that, uh, and others that are operating in super regulated environments. I mean, we saw that in government agencies and stuff as well. Well, I, without the cloud, yeah. this never would have happened. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's funny, I, I remember some of the more old school managers are thinking people aren't, aren't going to work less when they're working from home. They're going to be distracted. I think you're seeing the opposite where people are working too much. Yeah. And they get burnt out because you're just front of your computer all day. And so I think that we're learning. I think every, the whole industry is learning. Like, what does it mean to work from home, really? And yeah. uh, it's, it's a fascinating thing. It's, it's a case study we're all a part of right now. I was, I was talking to my wife last night about this. And you know, she's very thoughtful. And she was, when, when she was in the workforce, she was at a PR firm. And a guy came in, a guest speaker. It might even be the CEO of the company asking, you know, uh, what, 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 on average, what time, who stays at the office until, you know, who leaves by five o'clock, you know, a few hands went up. Or, or who, who stays until like eight o'clock, you know, and the hands went up. And then, so he, and he asked those people, like, why? Why can't you get your work done in, a, in an eight hour work day? I go home, why don't you go? And, mm -hmm. and I said to her, that's interesting, you know, because she's always looking at me like, why? <laughs> you know, uh, can't you do, you know, get it done? And I'm saying the world has changed. Yeah. It really has, where people are just on all the time. Yeah. I, I'm not sure it's sustainable, quite frankly. I mean, I think that yeah. we have to, you know, as organizations, think about. And I see companies doing that. You guys probably do as well. You know, take a four-day, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. week weekend um, just for your head. Um, but it's there's no playbook. Yeah. No, like, we're like I said, we're a part of a case study. It's also hard because people are distributed now. So you have you meetings on the East Coast, you can wake up at 7-4, and then you have meetings on the West Coast, you stay until 7 o'clock there, so yeah. your day just stretches out. So you got to manage this. And I think, we're, I think we'll figure it out. I, you know, we're good at figuring this stuff there's out. A, the there's a rise in asynchronous communication. Yeah. So with things like Slack and, and other you know, tools, as, as helpful as they are in many cases, it's a, it is an always-on mentality and like people look for that little green dot and you know if you're on you're online so my kids uh you know we have a term now for me because my office at home is upstairs and i'll come down and if it's if it's during the day they'll say oh dad you're going for a walk and talk yeah <laughs> you know which is like it's my way of getting away from the desk Total getting away from zoom and like you know even in boston uh you know getting outside trying to at least you know get a little exercise or walk and get a, you know get my head away from the computer screen. Um, but even then, it's often like, I'll, I'll get a Slack notification on my phone or someone will call me, even if it's not a scheduled walk and talk. Yeah. I'm, uh, and so that's, that is an interesting shift. A lot of ways to get in touch. Uh, Productivity's you know, presumably going to go through the roof. But yeah. all right, guys, I'll let you go. Thanks so much for Thanks. coming to theCUBE. I really yeah. appreciate it. And thank you for watching this CUBE Conversation. This is Dave Vellante, and we'll see you next time.